distinguished heads of state, uh, distinguished heads of government, excellencies, dear friends, our members and constituents, a very cordial welcome to the 41st annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. It's the first meeting in the second decade of this 21st century. And if we look back the last 10 years, what change has happened? The world has become much more complex. There are many more risks. We have identified, and you may have seen it, in our global risk report, over 30 risks which we have to address jointly as humankind if we want to construct our future in the right way. But there were other changes in the world. We had, in some way, the end of privacy during the last 10 years. We had an acceleration and compression of time. I would argue, I would argue that now we are living in a post-globalization era, which means globalization really has become a true reality. We also are living in a post-digitalization era, and hopefully we are living in a post-crisis era, even if we will have to digest still some aftershocks of the recent financial and economic crisis. In short, today, I think we can describe our situation as being bound together in a complete interdependence, its global togetherness. And here, you all in this room, you represent this global togetherness. Sometimes people say there are so many complex issues. How can we cope with all the change? It's speed. And we could even speak of some symptom of a global burnout. What does it mean, a global burnout? It means that we are much doing much more firefighting instead of addressing issues actively. It means that there is a danger of disengagement. In some way, when I look at my discussions which I had today, I would say there is a strange feeling of micro-optimism and macro-pessimism. We are all optimists here. I have seen so many enthusiastic people our young global leaders, our tech pioneers, looking with great optimism into the future. But when we look at the big issues on the global agenda, there is pessimism. How can we cope? We don't want to have this meeting here as a meeting of despair. There are so many opportunities in the world. How do you fight? the syndrome of a possible burnout. You fight it by new inspiration and by new self-confidence. This meeting shall be a meeting of recognizing the realities. We are not moving back to the old world. This meeting shall be a meeting of constructive optimism. That's the reason 
why we have chosen for this meeting as a theme to talk about shared values. Shared values for the new reality. And the program has four pillars. The first pillar, of course, is the economic outlook. The second pillar is to define what is really this new reality. And we could certainly give many definitions. For example, the shift of the economic and political gravity center from the north to the south, from west to east. We could talk about the race of the millennials, the new generation, and the power of the social media. We could talk about scarcity, the new era of scarcity of natural resources, and so on and so on. So the first pillar, economic outlook, the second pillar, the new reality. The third pillar of our program is to support and to assist the G20 process. We have worked closely together with the French presidency and already with the Mexican presidency for next year to help to make sure that we are here a big brainstorming, that we have a big brainstorming exercise on the issues of the G20. And finally, the fourth pillar, which we have, is we want to create a legacy. We want to create a global risk response network during this meeting. We want to help to increase global resilience against the manifold risks which we have to face simultaneously. Now, we speak about shared values. What do we mean? One of the elements of the new reality is also that we cannot choose anymore one norm or one value against another value. We are here in the same boat. We are a global community. So we have to recognize that we have diverse attitudes, cultures. And what we have to do is to balance out much better on a global level our different approaches. For example, we have to balance out the relationship between business and society. We have to balance out Western and Asian values. We have to balance out the relationship between national interests and global interests. We have to balance out spiritual against material values. This will be the effort which we will undertake over the next three days. Therefore, this meeting, we are here in Davos, in a global village. We are here to inspire, to interact, to share, and most importantly, to be committed to the mission of the World Economic Forum, to the mission of us all, to improving the state of the world. And ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon I was walking through one of the corridors of this new building and I saw a sentence. And I would like to quote to you this sentence because it characterizes very much the spirit which should um, be prevailing over the next days. The writing says, we should be all optimists and idealists. We know, we do not know exactly 
where we are heading, but we know the direction and we are, now, and we are on our way. Ladies and gentlemen, j'ai maintenant le grand plaisir d'inviter Madame Micheline Calmiret, qui est la présidente de la Confédération, confédération et head of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland. And she will address us on behalf of the host country. Mais Madame la Présidente, Madame President, avant que vous preniez la parole, before you address us, I would be permitted to express our great gratitude to you for the hospitality that always embraces us here in Davos and in Switzerland, in your country. I must add that, as far as I'm concerned, and the World Economic Forum that has its headquarters in Geneva, it is, of course, with special pleasure that I greet you here as a representative of the canton of Geneva, as the person who's going to open officially this year's forum, and to see the spirit of Davos, the spirit of Switzerland, and also the spirit of the canton of Geneva born by you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to thank the government of the canton of Grison, of Graubünden, thank these authorities most warmly. The canton of Graubünden is a wonderful canton and is assuming the responsibility of the safety and security that we all enjoy here. All I can say is that we are very, very grateful that we are hosted here. And a very special thanks goes to the community, the municipality of Davos, represented here by its authorities, by its elected leaders, the mayor of Davos, the Landamann, that is the mayor of Davos, Hans-Peter Michel. And I would also like to address the population of Davos. You have created and built for us here a wonderful a Congress Center, absolutely perfect for such an encounter where we can exchange views and opinions. It is ideal for dialogue, and we would like to thank the population most warmly for this gift. Madam President, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président, Señor Presidente, Excellencias, Señoras y Señores, la mundialización de la economía, las tecnologías, las comunicaciones y los transportes ha dejado traslucir unos riesgos de una amplitud sin precedentes. Va a citar la pobreza, la inestabilidad de los mercados financieros, el cambio climático, los cambios medioambientales a nivel mundial, la escasez de recursos naturales, presiones migratorias y terrorismo. Estos riesgos están interrelacionados y trascienden las fronteras nacionales. Además, aumentan el país pobre, alors même que el fossé entre país riches y país pauvre se creuse. Songez que le produit intérieur brut par habitant de la Suisse est 130 fois supérieur à celui d'un habitant du Mozambique. Les pays les plus pauvres ne bénéficient pas suffisamment de la mondialisation qu'ils nourrissent pourtant par l'exportation de leurs ressources naturelles. Cette situation exige que les États arbitres entre demande intérieure et demande extérieure et soulèvent des questions. 
un quart de la population du monde consomme les trois quarts de ses ressources. Comment, mesdames et messieurs, disposer d'eau potable, de nourriture, de matières premières, de ressources naturelles et énergétiques en quantité suffisante et à un coût accessible pour répondre aux besoins de bientôt 7 milliards d'êtres humains. Comment rendre le développement équitable For sufficient et comment se drinking water, sur la food, au raw materials, Dans la at a, priorité, an acceptable cost. De plus en plus so, political leaders have to think about the, e the common will of their people and make sure that their decisions do not impact negatively on other nations. So this perspective of a world commonwealth of destiny or a world risk-taking society is becoming ever clearer, bringing forth new philosophies. Negotiations on climate change show, show very well that the world vision is restricted to national thinking and that can bring about disastrous risks. De la vulnérabilité, we have to take de into la account the vulnerability and the Il loss of dignity. It is absolutely necessary to change our way of thinking so that we can negotiate with regard to the rights and responsibilities of such world public will. Management of global risks that would go against the struggle against poverty could not bring about successful alliances. Ladies and gentlemen, we have at our fingertips the technologies, the knowledge and the financial resources to overcome these worldwide risks. But at the end of the day, with regard to climate change, for example, the question is to know whether we'd be able to overcome this gulf between diverging interests and create a new common world identity. There is no superior authority that can impose any proof or accountability. Who takes decisions with regard to the nature of risk? Who is responsible? Who decides about the criteria of cause and effect? Who decides about compensation to be given to those who are affected? To allow for international cooperation to find answers to these questions and reconcile the diverging interests, it's very important to have a dialogue on norms and values and to deal with this issue of global justice. It's not enough for the states to just play a role or for, for them to define a national policy. One has to take into account not just justice within a country or between countries, but for mankind in its entirety. Global justice is a prerequisite for a sustainable development, and we have to understand that our lifestyle is not sustainable. We have to understand that it is unfair vis-a-vis -vis of certain world populations that our lifestyle should continue in this way. The solutions that we are looking for have to be fair and equitable for the whole planet. Economic and social integration would make justice that is limited to national or regional frontiers an illusion. We have to see everything in global terms. This has to be done with regard to institutional decisions and agreements and has to bring about policies that will help those who are living in extreme poverty. We have to guarantee that the resources and chances are, and opportunities are distributed in such a way so that those who are the most vulnerable actually benefit from true freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, all these solutions have to be aimed at greater sustainability and will have a different kind of variable, a different kind of impact on people and will require that responsibility be shared. This transition will require responsibility based on collective interests of a community and on bringing about different thinking regarding priorities and justice.
Albert Einstein said that you cannot resolve a problem there where it has appeared. This takes account in particular the challenges that are to be met not only in industrialized countries but also in the emerging and developing ones in order to bring about a policy that will ensure growth with low carbon emissions, which will nonetheless guarantee economic growth that will not destroy its own ideological foundations. Transition towards greater sustainability could bring about alliances with emerging countries so that energy systems be adopted that are respectful of the climate. The poorer countries would therefore have the possibility of building their future without disturbing or disrupting climate systems and give them better development chances. Ladies and gentlemen, all this will affect us whether we are rich or poor. We live today in a polycentric world where local processes, the national, regional and global ones as well, are all interlinked. In an interlinked world, the decisions of one government will have effects on other populations and not only of the population of that state. That is why one also has to consider the plurality of our governance model making sure that there's room for nation states, for local authorities, for multilateral agencies, for the transnational actors, for business fora, for non-governmental organizations, civil society, and so on and so forth. This debate on global governments also deals with the way in which international communities work and on the reorganization of multilateral organizations. We have to stress international cooperation, whereas in the national governments as well as in multilateral organizations, actual political change requires great effort and a large-scale institutional renewal. Since the Conference of Rio, we have made some progress to reconcile the economies, the society, and the environment. The Commission of Sustainable Development and the ECOSOC of the United Nations have been very helpful in finding a farther-reaching political consensus, but no organization has been able to take the leadership in such a redirection policy. International governments re remains very fragmented and not very effective, whereas we do need a, an organization that can bring forth a new dynamism which we, with which we can overcome all these blockages. And if we do not want to create new institutions, then it is by the fundamental far change of those that exist that we can make progress. So why not change the ECOSOC into a sustainability council, which could become the meeting place where we could find a new political equilibrium. The proposal made by Madame Merkel in 2009 to create an economic council of the United Nations and the proposals for, of the panel to have a stronger ECOSOC to meet with all the challenges and changes in 2005 are very interesting proposals. Let's seize this opportunity to actually have a real council for sustainability well anchored in the United Nations system. Ladies and gentlemen, let us remember knowledge and experience that we have gained last year, and let's now take on all these world challenges that concern us all. The world is very fragile, so let's take care. The World Economic Forum at Davos is a very special meeting place for all those who have the key of change in their hand to look for new solutions of synergy. So it is with satisfaction and with confidence about possible progress that I'm very pleased and honored to open this year's event. And on behalf of the Swiss government, I would like to welcome you here in Davos. Thank you.